And we are back with gases, the super exciting topic of gases. So when we're talking about gases, some things to remember, just our phase change. If we looked at a container and we drew gas particles within that, we need them to be as spaced pretty much as far away as they humanly can be. So lots of big open spaces, kind of like our current society. So with that, <clears throat> our properties of gases. We get some four important properties, most of which we've already discussed. Um, some of the big ones that are kind of new to us would be the low density, which makes sense if there's lots of open space. Within that given volume, we have a very small mass. So our density being mass to volume would suggest that we're looking at um, low densities. And then the other one that <clears throat> because they're so open, we're going to get uniform mixtures. So if we have multiple different gases in a container, I would expect them to mix uniformly across it. So for instance, if we had, say, two types of gases, we would not expect a system like this because those are now not uniformly mixed. They are split kind of half on one side and half on the other. That doesn't happen with gases. Um, so don't do that with gases. Uh, one thing that is kind of new for gases is that gases will exert a force on the container that holds them. Because they're constantly moving, their kinetic energy goes up, which means when those particles impact things, you're getting a translation of force in the form of kinetic energy into an impact. That force is what we call pressure. Okay, So we're going to get a new... Uh, measurement device, if you will, coming out with gases. When we talk about gases, it is important to acknowledge that what we are talking about are ideal gases. We're not talking about real gases. <clears throat> and the reason why is that real things behave very oddly. Uh, ideal things behave according to strict rules. Uh, so, yeah, let's just work with that. So when we're talking about ideal gases, these are kind of our, our rules that are associated with them. And real gases don't follow this. But some of these are kind of interesting and some of them kind of stand out as things that might seem counterintuitive. So let's go ahead and start with the first one. They are super tiny molecules. Uh, that in and of itself isn't a big observation, but the big observation is actually the parenthetical. When we talk about a gas particle, it has no volume. So if I'm going to look at this closed container, let's say it has a volume of two liters. The instant I put a gas particle in there, well, that particle is now occupying that volume, which means the volume accessible for the next particle that goes in should be somewhat less than two liters because the red dot is now occupying it. Kind of makes sense? Except that gases, we say, they don't have a volume, which means that blue dot that I now add has the exact same access to space as the red dot had to begin with. Okay, um, So that doesn't seem to make much physical sense to us, but the, what we're thinking about is on a much larger scale. When someone walks into our classroom, the volume of the classroom has decreased because the next person can't exist where that person is is located with the gas because they are constantly moving and they're so such a small density uh, we make the approximation that it doesn't matter how much gas you put into a container the volume of the container stays constant okay uh, and that is kind of or the volume accessible to the gas particles stays constant and that's kind of a, an odd one but it simplifies a lot of the calculations that we would end up running when we talk about volume and gases. Next one, pretty straightforward. We're just going to assume that our gas molecules um, move in straight lines and they're traveling in random directions. So they don't change directions unless they impact something to cause them to move. Uh, really, this would be a corollary or a subsetting of the next rule that I've got on this list, and that's that they have no attraction for one another. So when we're talking about random or straight lines, they don't turn or have spin associated with them uh, or get attracted one direction or another. They're moving in a straight place. 
two individual particles as they're moving through, regardless of how close they get, as long as they never touch, they don't affect the other atoms or the other gas particles uh, direction or speed. So there's no attraction there. Okay? That again is a requirement uh, to simplify our calculations. The next one is molecules collide without losing energy. This becomes important because if our gas particles started colliding, eventually they would just stop moving, right? Because we're losing energy, right? So one of our assumptions that we put in is that that loss of energy is so minimal that we don't see it, okay? So no loss of energy. And then the last one that we can reference here is that kinetic energy of gas particles is proportional to the temperature, meaning when it gets hotter, things move more. When it gets cooler, things move less, okay? If we take all of these things into kind of consideration uh, with our ideal gases, we get an interesting expression that can be solved for. Um, this expression is something that was in chapter 8 that one mole of any gas equals 22.4 liters, okay? This expression or this equality I have massive issues with, okay? And really, if you memorize anything in this class, I don't want you memorizing this. That said, you're responsible for it, and it's an expectation, a stupid, stupid, stupid expectation. So we'll soapbox here for a little bit, okay? This relates moles and liters. So why does this become problematic? What was the last video that you just watched? Oh, molarity. What did that relate? Moles and liters. Moles and liters. This is moles and liters, but it's for a gas, okay? Moles and liters for molarity will work for any solution. Moles and liters for a gas, this equality only works if it's a gas, okay? If we look at how I talked about it, I talked about molarity first. If we look at where the textbook references molarity, it's after it introduces this gas conversion. Okay? So they're saying gases are more important. Well, let's look to your experiences in labs. When was the last time you did an experiment that involved anything to do with a gas? Dramatic pause. You didn't. And you probably won't. Okay? At best, you get one experiment that deals with gases, and then that's it. Gases are harder to work with because they go everywhere. So it requires much stricter conditions, safety, glassware, equipment, like everything just goes to the roof. Uh, which means that you probably won't be doing any experiments with gases. So why are we giving you this conversion factor? So that you have another thing to memorize for lecture and doing conversions. That's it. That's its sole purpose. Okay? If that's not bad enough, Let's add in that there's a parenthetical here, meaning that this thing that we're telling you to memorize isn't always true. It's only true some of the time. When is it true? When we're at STP. I'm starting to get a little bit riled here. Okay, well, what is STP? Maybe that some of the time is the most of the time that we exist. So it's standard temperature and pressure. Well, standard, that makes sense. Okay, so everybody would use the same standard temperature and pressure. False. Depending on your training, origin of training, uh, discipline, standard temperature and pressure changes. Okay? Chemists reference one standard temperature and pressure. Physicists will reference another. Engineers will reference another. Somebody in a different country will reference another. There is not a standard temperature and pressure. Okay? similar to how we would define a standard measurement for length. Okay? So standard, bad term. But let's just say it's standard, okay? and let's move on to the next one, temperature. We can measure temperature, so we're saying we're agreeing to a certain temperature. Okay? Let's just say that we accepted the standard. Let's, what's the temperature? Let this be a temperature that we are all typically at. Uh, typically at where? In a lab, outside the lab, okay, in in Africa, okay, in the Antarctic, because when we move to those different locations, the temperature is going to change. Okay, so I'm being unreasonable. Let's do it in a lab where we have air conditioning, temperature control. It would, of course, be 
ballpark room temperature. I'll even give you a five degree spread. We'll say anywhere between 20 degrees Celsius and 25 degrees Celsius. Heck, 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's a fine. We'll accept that. Nope, that's not standard temperature. Guess what standard temperature is? Zero degrees Celsius. So we are telling you to memorize this equality at a condition that we don't do work at. Why? Because we want you to memorize another equality so that we can have you do conversions. It's stupid. Okay. Next one is pressure, standard pressure. One atmosphere, at least that one's somewhat decent. We get a decent number out of, out of it. One atmosphere, except pressure changes with altitude. So depending on where you are running your experiment, be it at sea level or be it on Mount Everest, your pressure changes. Because your pressure changes, this equality changes, which then means that equality isn't an equality. Okay? So it's a dumb, stupid thing to make you memorize, but as you might be able to tell, it's in a red box, which then means, what do you need to do? Effing memorize it. Okay? You are responsible for knowing that conversion factor. Okay? You can memorize it for this exam, and you can memorize, or for exam three, and you can memorize it for the final, and then please, God, forget it. Okay? B delete it from your brain, because it is a stupid thing to memorize. Okay? And with all of that yelling and screaming about how dumb it is, you've now probably actually memorized it, which is extra irritating to me. But, deep breath. <sighs> Let's move on. Okay? The gas force that we addressed in the last thing is what's known as pressure. Okay, so our pressure is going to come up, and that's where that standard that 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 P of our STP comes from. So let's look at how we could use this conversion factor in some calculations. So, real quickly, how many liters are needed to hold 2.0 grams of hydrogen gas? Okay, so what am I being asked for? I want liters. And I'm being given 2.0 grams of hydrogen gas. And we don't have to write the, the gas there. Okay, so this becomes a bit challenging on deciding where to place things because the measurement and the substance aren't, aren't obvious. The substance for liters is technically going to be hydrogen. Okay, so we could place that in the numerator because that was our given piece of information and we could just run with that. So we could then go through and say, well, I need a conversion. In that conversion, grams needs to disappear. So I'll place that in the denominator and I would need liters to appear and place it in the numerator. Does this conversion exist? Okay. Soapbox. It exists just as much as the 22.4 liters equals to one mole exists. It does. It's stupid. Okay, so it doesn't exist. Okay, really, that's not something you're expected to memorize. So we would need to come up with a way that we could relate these. So we're going to have to change one of these units. Well, we did just address that liters can be related to moles of hydrogen gas. And in that, we said that 22.4 liters is one mole of hydrogen gas. Okay, so if we looked at our units, we actually haven't simplified anything, but we did at least bring in that liters. Okay, I still need to get rid of grams of hydrogen. I now also need to get rid of moles of hydrogen. Where do I find the relationship between mass and moles? Well, that's on the periodic table because hydrogen has a mass of one. There are two hydrogens in H2, and we get 2.0 grams is one mole. There's our conversion factor. Ta-da! Nifty, neato. We can now punch it into a calculator, and we would get 22.4 liters for these two grams of hydrogen gas, right? Because the twos end up canceling out as well. Kind of makes sense? One thing I do want to address that's kind of neat about this thing, and it's not so much that it's neat about that conversion factor, it's neat because of the ideal gas system. What if this was elephants? Okay, moles of elephants 
leaders of elephants. If I could somehow convert elephants, elephants into the gas phase, one mole of elephants would be equal to 22.4 liters. Which just seems absurd, but what we have to remember is that we're talking about it as a gas, and as an ideal gas, those elephants have no volume. So one mole of those elephants will equal 22.4 liters, as long as we're making the assumption that my elephant gas is ideal. Okay, so that gas particle, the substance, can be anything, which is kind of neat, but that has nothing to do with the conversion factor. That has everything to do with the assumptions that we put on gases to act as, behave as ideal. Okay, so we now have a basic fundamental on how to deal with those conversions. So we might as well kick it up a big notch. Ta-da! New question. How many liters, sorry, as I read the old question, how many liters of hydrogen are produced from the reaction of 0.165 grams of aluminum metal with dilute hydrochloric acid? In this statement, we've got a couple things going for us. Number one, we have a chemical equation, which we would need to verify was balanced, just for the record. We're also given... 1.65 grams of aluminum, which we might go through and decide that we could simplify and write out as AL. And we have what we're being asked for, liters of hydrogen, which writing it in purple was a bad idea. So what I'm being asked for is the liters of hydrogen, okay, and officially hydrogen gas. How do I know it's H2? Because it doesn't say atoms. And I need to somehow use the conversion factors found in red and purple, and from memory to go through and solve this. Okay, so with that, I'm going to let you go ahead and take a swing at that. So go ahead and hit pause or tap your space bar, stop the video, and we'll wait for you to go through and solve. Hopefully you're coming back because you're like, oh, this long pause is awkward, Mike. Why aren't you uh, continuing to solve this? Because I'm still waiting for those people that haven't clicked pause to go ahead and click pause and solve this, or at least attempt to solve this on their own. And we're just going to say that's good enough. Okay, so if we go through and look at the given information, we have a measurement of grams. We have a substance of liters. Both of those things are different than where we ended. We have a measurement of liters and a substance of hydrogen. Okay? This means I'm going to have to do both a measurement conversion and a substance conversion. Okay? For me personally, I think the substance conversion is the easiest one to do because the substance conversion comes from the balanced chemical equation. Key word in that being the B for balanced. If we take a look at our chemical equation that's been given to us, it is not balanced, so we are responsible for acknowledging that it is not balanced and attempting to go through and balance it. When we start this, we'll notice that it doesn't balance nicely because when I go through and do it, I don't get nice numbers for the hydrogen. So what will end up happening is this. You should spend some time to figure out how to balance that to make sure that you know that that's going back and reviewing that old school material. Hydrogen is the substance I want on top. Aluminum is the substance I want on the bottom. Why did I pick aluminum? What was the given substance? Because it's a balanced chemical equation, I'm going to use moles as my measurement because that's what comes out of the balanced chemical equation. The numbers from my balanced chemical equation, assuming I did balance that right, okay, there are three moles of hydrogen and there are two moles of aluminum. I now have a single piece of information that I can work from. This now establishes that I have, or I now have a bit of information that I can work with. I don't want moles of aluminum. So I can look to my question and see if I'm given moles of aluminum, and I'm not. So I'm going to have to convert the moles of aluminum to something else. So that's where looking at the question can come in handy. I do have aluminum showing up, but I have it as a different measurement, grams. So how about we go to grams of aluminum? 
before you start throwing the 0.165 grams of aluminum into that, realize that that thing in the red box is a single piece of information. It does not relate to the moles of aluminum. Where do I find the relationship between moles and mass? That would be on the periodic table. And if I remember correctly, I think, whoops, it's 26.98. I've been pausing it to go look it up, but I just don't feel like doing that right now. So we'll say 26.98 grams of aluminum is one mole. And that came from our periodic table. This is cool because that got rid of our moles of aluminum. I don't want the grams of aluminum, so that means I'm going to have to go through and add in that step as well. Grams of aluminum so that my unit can cancel. Am I given just grams of aluminum? Of course I am, and of course I am in a different color than I'd written out. But there's our grams of aluminum canceling. 0 0.1165 grams. Fantastic numerator. This was a given piece of information. So do I now have the answer? Well, let's go back through and look at the work. Grams of aluminum canceled, moles of aluminum canceled, moles of hydrogen. Moles of hydrogen are not the leaders of hydrogen, which means I need to get rid of the moles of hydrogen. Ideally, what do I bring in? Well, the leaders of hydrogen. Where do I find the conversion factor between the liters of hydrogen and the moles of hydrogen? That would be 22.4 liters equaling one mole. And I now have a conversion that would now allow me to go through and do this. So if we set this up, our moles of hydrogen cancel. And liters of hydrogen would now be my answer. I could punch this into the calculator. And this time I will pause to use the magic of computers and distance learning. And in blue at the far right, I would get 0 0.205486 liters of hydrogen. Because I'm awesome and remember sig figs, I would go back and see that three sig figs was all I was allowed to keep. And my answer is actually 0 0.205, because four is less than five liters of hydrogen. And there is my glorious answer with all of that work. Again, the process of moving through this becomes the important aspect. Why are you putting information in for your individual solve? Guarantee that if you look this up online for how someone's going to show this work, they're going to do the red conversion on the left. After they follow the red conversion, they'll do the black. After they do the black, they'll do purple, and then they will do green. Okay, Why? Because... A reflex is ultimately what it's coming down to. And that why becomes a very important question. If you want to go through and just solve these by following an algorithm, then by all means, check how the internet's doing this. What I'm asking you to do is to think about why you're doing the conversions that you're doing. As long as you do all four of these steps in these proper numerator denominators, it doesn't matter the sequence in which you write them as long as you know why you are placing them where you are placing them. If your reason is because you know what the answer is, then I hope you always know what the answer is. Okay? And right now, I certainly don't feel like I know the answer. So remember that. Okay. So again, think about our process behind how we solve. Standard methods give us formulas and we try and punch in formulas. You then have to remember where all this information is stored. According to the, and it's not my method, but using dimensional analysis, it's now just a question of manipulating the information you've got and then also knowing where to find other stuff. Okay, In the standard method, you have to memorize all of these possible formulas. In my method, all you're doing is just what is dimensional analysis and then where to find information. Right? There isn't a formula to memorize. It actually simplifies the amount of effort that you have to go through and do as long as you spend the time to learn that process. Okay? And that's the point here. Learn the process. Okay? With that, we'll go ahead and move on to our process.